What we're doing right now is just saying thank you, not asking you for a thing, just saying thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And so we wanted to do something small, and so uh, in your behalf, Pastor, would you please come and open this little this tiny memento that we have for you that came from the midst of Nairobi? Come on, you can do it. Thank you, brother. We are so grateful from the bottom of our heart to you and this great church. <clears throat> Amen. Well, it's good to be with you today. You know, you will never know what uh, Marigold and I have felt in this great church. We came several months ago to a meeting, and then we were fortunate enough to get to share the gospel or preach the word to you back in September, and I, I just want you to know that we came within this close to spending a hundred and some odd thousand dollars just to be close enough so that when we're home from Africa, we could be in this church while we're here. Didn't quite make it, but it's something that we had in our hearts, and I want you to know that when we start this meeting this morning. The meeting started a long time ago when we started this part of the meeting this morning. And I want you to know that I feel a little bit this morning like a, a fellow I heard about one time. They were having a, a meeting up in heaven after the rapture had taken place and everybody was gathered around giving their testimonies of the things that had happened to them while they were on earth. And one guy came up and he said, I, I, just, I just got to tell. I, Peter was the moderator, so he said, I just have to tell you what happened to me because I was in the great Johnstown flood. A number of years ago when the dam burst. And when, when uh, it, the dam burst, the Lord spared me supernaturally. And I just have to tell my story. So Peter said, well, that's a wonderful story and I think you should share it. He said, there's only one thing I think you need to be aware of. Noah will be in the audience. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I understand. I haven't seen him yet. I'm sure he's here somewhere. But... My favorite preacher in the whole wide world is in this service this morning. Brother Branko, where are you? I still haven't said it. There you, are. there you are. My favorite preacher in the whole I always wanted to preach like Brother Branko. That was my goal in life was to preach like Brother Branko. And I want you to know, brother, it's an honor to have you sitting in this service this morning. Love you more than I can ever tell you. You just mean the world to me, and you always have, and you always will. One of the greatest honors of my life was when I was pastoring down in southern Louisiana, and Brother Brankel came and shared a revival for us while we were there. Tried to get him to come back several times, never could quite manage it, but uh, I just want you to know how much I love you, brother, and it's a joy to be here. And I, I, I just, it's my pleasure. If you see a few tears, just overlook it. <laughs> Good to be in God's house today. I love your pastor. I told him just as we, I told Torin just as we started the service, I said, you know, I said, there's going to be a lot of glare on this platform today. <laughs> I hope you can stand it. I've known, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I know now it's okay. <laughs> Brother Johnson and I have known each other since uh, Hector was a pup, as they used to say. Youth camping days back in Arkansas, back in the six was it, yeah I guess it was the early '60s, and uh, we've we've known each other well for all these years, and I've loved he and Sister Pam for so very long. I, I, I don't know whether you know it, but she's a woman of great courage with her back situation. In short, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here today. I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew. 
ex-tax collector, ex-thief. Aren't you glad we can be exes in Jesus? <clears throat> I'll be going from here to uh, the book of Colossians. We're an ex-murderer, an ex-self-righteous Pharisee. Aren't you glad we can be an ex when Jesus calls us? Hallelujah. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 21, begin reading with verse number 1, please. I know I had glasses a few minutes ago, but I'm not sure where they went. Ah, wrong pocket. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So when the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Now turn with me, if you will, to the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. I ask you a question. Who is this? He is the, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness should dwell." And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him where the things on earth are things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Who is this? He's Jesus. And there is none like him, never has been, never will be. And I'm going to speak to you for a few moments today on the subject, restoring Jesus to his church. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for the great privilege of being in this service today. Thank you for the people that have gathered here to worship. Thank you for the songs that have gone before. Thank you for this great choir. Thank you for the ministry of music. Thank you for Brother Gary and his sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Father, for the privilege of sharing the greatest truth that any human being could ever take into their mouth and Speak from their lips, because I want to talk about Jesus today. And Father, I'm asking you in Jesus' name to allow your Holy Spirit to make the words real, because that's his station, is to exalt Jesus Christ. He didn't come to speak of himself. He came to speak of Jesus. And I'm asking that the Holy Spirit will come and make that happen today, that the presence of our Lord will be so real that anyone here can reach out and touch the hem of his garment. And I ask, Father, that there will be change before we walk out of this building. 
Because without change, there is no learning. And without change, there certainly can never be revival. So I'm asking you, Father, for change. And I pray that you'll anoint our lips to speak and hearts to receive. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen and amen. General William Booth was a great, great man of God. He is the founder of the Salvation Army. General Booth lived from about 1829 to around 1912. And not long before the end of his life, when he did die, I might mention to you that when the, uh, the mortician was preparing his body for burial and they unclothed him to redress him in his burial garment, they discovered that on his knees were calluses like those of a camel because William Booth was such a man of prayer. And William Booth made the comment not long before his death, under the anointing and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he spoke these words. He said, the day will come, the Lord says, the day will come when my people will pray to a God they do not know. He said they will preach salvation without repentance and they will worship, worship. And friends, I want you to understand, I believe that we are in those days. Please recognize with me that when I say these things to you, that I'm not speaking to this church individually because if ever there is an exception, this is one of those great churches. But remember that my wife and I travel from border to border and coast to coast. We've been in churches of from 30 to 3,000, and we've seen so much of what is happening in the church today. And it is extremely disturbing to me. It hurts my heart when we travel and see these kinds of things that are going on. And I, I have found that we have reached that place to where we don't worship God as much, or we, we don't worship Jesus. And, and what I'm really trying to say by that is that there's so much talk about God. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. If you talk about Yahweh or you talk about Jehovah, that's one thing. But God is a very generic term. It is a term that comes from the Greek word theos, and the tree out in the yard, if you worshiped, it could be a god. So God is a very generic term, and I believe that the worship of Jesus has by large extent been taken away. It is a frightening thing to me to discover that in the evangelical community in America today, and that's supposed to be the most uh, conservative wing of Christianity, in the evangelical community, more than 50% say there is no such thing as absolute truth. 57% say that there may be many ways to God, that Jesus is not necessarily the exclusive way to God. That, my dear friends, is frightening for, for the simple reason that if that were to be true, then Jesus died for nothing. And I want you to know he did not die for nothing. He died for you, and he died for me. Now remember, we're talking about Jesus today. And I remember so well the Jesus movement of the 70s. God did so many great things during that period of time. There was a nationwide interest in Jesus Christ because it was called the Jesus movement. Chuck Smith was baptizing thousands of people in the Pacific Ocean. People were coming into churches right off the street. I remember the day I was pastoring a very fast-growing church in Bastrop, Louisiana. We had gone from about 250 discouraged people or to, to about uh, uh, somewhere near 1,000 people on a Sunday morning. And it was exciting to see what was going on. And I was invited out to one of those church growth seminars out in Dallas, Texas. Brother Zimmerman invited me to come. And, and, and they got, put us on a panel. And they got down to me and said, well, what is it your church is doing to grow the way you are? And I said very sincerely, God is doing great things in spite of all I can do to hinder him. And I meant it. Because it was all the Holy Spirit. It was the Lord of harvest who was making things happen. It wasn't me. It wasn't some kind of new method. It was simply revival. It was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I remember one revival in which I baptized on Sunday morning 101 people. I have to tell you the next Monday morning I was worn out. 
I was sore. I was tired. I could hardly get out of bed because 275 people had come in off the streets to accept Jesus. And I remember the day that I was sitting on the platform and I saw a group of genuine, grade A, 100% hippies walk in the back door. They were barefooted. They were filthy. Their hair was all the way down their back. They wore torn clothing. And one girl in particular, she had taken a t-shirt and she had cut it up in ways that you can't even believe. And she had taken a pair of blue jeans. She had cut them off to just below her hip. And then she had cut the side and put tennis shoe strings so that it didn't have to hold together. And she was barefoot. And when she walked in the back door, I was sitting on the platform and I said, Lord, nobody has seen that girl yet. Will you please just let her stop on the back seat? But she didn't stop. She kept coming. When she had reached halfway, I said, Lord, only half this congregation has seen that girl. Will you please stop her right there halfway? But she didn't stop. She came all the way down to the very front seat. And she and her friends sat down. And I preached that message that morning. That morning, And I, I gave the altar call. She was the very first person. She jumped up. She fell across the altar. Now remember how she's dressed. Everybody in the congregation had to turn their head just a little bit. And I've never been so thankful for those dear Pentecostal church ladies because they saw what was happening and they all gathered around and got their long dresses kind of stretched out so nobody could see. But that girl found glorious salvation that day. It was the Jesus movement, and Jesus was being exalted. Jesus was being uplifted. Jesus was the one who was being preached. I remember going down here to Russellville back about 1971, and, and God just, and we started a revival on a, a Monday night. Any evangelist, Brother Branko can tell you, any evangelist does not start a meeting on Monday night. Because it's a hard time, friends, to get folks to come out to church if you haven't had some momentum from Sunday. So we started on Monday night, and things were, things, you know, I mean, it was okay. We had a few people, maybe two or three people saved, and the next night we had a little bigger crowd, and two or three people got saved, and finally Sunday night rolled around, and the, the night for us to close the revival. And I got up, and and, and we, we were singing. We had had a revival of, of the singing group that we had had back in Bible school. The youth pastor and his wife and Marigold and me called ourselves the Philadelphians. We got up to have a revival, one of those, uh, uh, you know, those nostalgia things. I quit persecuting the saints long ago, by the way, with music. My wife is great, but I quit persecuting the saints. But we sang that night. And I looked over at the, past, the, the, the youth pastor, and I said, Brother, I said, something very special is here tonight. He said, I feel it too. So I just turned to the congregation, and I said, if there's anybody here that came to get saved, this is your moment. And i got to be honest with you and tell you that I was surprised when all the young people, it was, three, it was a three-section uh, building, and all the young people sat on the left side. There must have been about 100 of them there that night. Fifteen of them got up and rushed to the altar, and they accepted Jesus as the Lord of their lives. The pastor came to me and said, we can't stop this. Will you please stay? Well, you know how, maybe you know how it is with an evangelist. I mean, you have a schedule, and you know you're supposed to be in the next place, and you want to be ready to go to the next place, but I made all the phone calls that were necessary, and because I'm, I'm one of those preachers that simply doesn't believe that if you get a fire started in one place, you don't try to put it out and go somewhere else. They're too hard to start. So I said, yes, we'll stay. The next night came around. We did the same thing. It was a repeat of the night before, 15 more. Three weeks later, there were 120 people who had accepted Jesus as the Lord of their lives. And I'm not talking about 
transfer growth. I'm talking about people from off the streets. As a matter of fact, the last night of that revival, that building was packed. And teachers from the school came and said, we have to see what's going on because these kids used to be discipline problems, and now all they want to do is talk about Jesus. That was the Jesus movement. It was the days of David Wilkerson when he went to New York City and saw the powerful move of God in the gangs. What I'm trying to say to you, friends, it wasn't a matter of talking about some generic term about God. It was all about Jesus. It was all about Jesus. It was all about Jesus. And friends, please hear me this morning. It is God himself who made the choice that in him should all the fullness of the Godhead dwell bodily. And the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, his job is to exalt and to and to and to make Jesus real wherever he is. Listen, friends, the whole of the Trinity is involved in this business of putting Jesus first in everything. He is the God man. He is our representative. He is the one who came for the purpose of making us whole. When man could not live by the law, when man could not live by his conscience, when man could do none of those things, Jesus Christ came and gave his life as the perfect man to be our sacrifice and took our sins to the cross and the handwriting of ordinances that was against us were nailed there. And now we are free by the grace of God to live a life of freedom in this world. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the son of the living God. I'm going to talk about the four square gospel in just a minute, but you see, here's what you have to know first. Jesus is who he says he is. Do you understand that, there, that he never gave us the choice of saying he was a good man or a prophet? Because you see, if he knew what he was saying about himself was not true, then he was a liar. And if he didn't know it and he said it anyway, he was a lunatic. And there's only one last choice, and that is he is exactly who he said he was And friends, I don't know about you, and you can be deceived by the devil if you want to, but I want you to know, as far as I'm concerned, Jesus is the Son of the living God. And I want to tell you this morning, I don't care what 57% of the evangelical community says. The book of Acts still says there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except through the name of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something this morning. I would not spend my life going to Africa. I would not spend my life going to places where I knew that very possibly we might not make it out alive if I did not believe that Jesus is is the only way and he is everything that he said he was and he's the only way of salvation I remember the day we went deep in the bush to preach the word of God we set up tents that's the way we did things bass pro tents a little advertising for Johnny Morris there bass pro tents and we would set them up and we would we would put them in a little bit of a circle and I remember when we went to a, a place called Old Pussy Moro, way, way back on the Tanzania border. Nobody had ever seen a white person there. I remember so well, I parked my Land Cruiser. To, an old man walked up, and he rubbed his hand along the side of that Land Cruiser, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, I've heard these things exist, but I've never seen one. That's how far in the bush we were. They'd never seen anybody like us. As a matter of fact, when we would pull into the villages, all you'd see is the bottom of the little kid's feet running because they thought some kind of ghost had come to their village. But the next morning, after we finally found a place to set up our camp, during the night, I'll never forget it, we had hung a lantern on, the, on a tree out there, just, just a few feet from our tents, just to give us ourselves a little bit of security. And we would hire guards from the village, and we hung that lamp up there. And, and uh, uh, about, I don't know, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, I heard a noise, and I looked out of our tent, and there standing only a few feet from our tent was a hyena making all kinds of racket. 
The next morning when we woke up, the Maasai guards came to me and he said, they said to me, Buana, they said last night the Somalis came. They had their guns. And they said, you get out of the way because we're going to kill these people tonight. And he said, Buana, the only reason they did this is because we told them if they kill you, they're going to have to come through us first because you have a message from God and we want to hear it. What was our message? Jesus. Jesus. Somebody once asked me, what, what, what do you attribute the success of your ministry in Africa? Jesus. We've got one message. Jesus. 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 And more Jesus. And it works. Because he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. It's all about Jesus, the Son of the living God. And let me tell you something while I'm on this subject. You're hearing a lot of people today talk about other religions having the same God. It's the same God. Don't you believe it for a second. And let me tell you why. Because the Apostle John in his writing, in his epistle said, any spirit that denies that Jesus is God in the flesh is antichrist. Now, you can't, you can't make any stronger statement than that. Every spirit that denies that Jesus is the Christ is antichrist. So don't you try to tell me that Allah and Jehovah are one and the same. They are not. They are not. And, and sometimes, just do this little experiment. Go into a public place. I won't tell you to go into a bar. That wouldn't be a good idea for a believer. But go into a public place and walk into that place and say, I'm a believer in God. You know you won't get much reaction. I'll tell you why. Because if a Muslim is there, he's thinking of Allah. No problem. If a Hindu is there, he's thinking about the great unconscious. No problem. And I could go on and on down the list. But if you go into that same place just a few days later and you say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, you watch the reaction you'll get. And I'll tell you why. It's because that name has power. It's because that name is victorious. It's because that name causes demons to start to move. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He is the son of the living God, but he is also our Savior. Oh, thank God for salvation. Thank God that he was willing to go to the cross. As I said a few moments ago, man could not help himself. There was nothing man could do for himself. He tried over and over and over again. He could not do it. Only Jesus lived a perfect life, and only Jesus could take our sins to the cross of Calvary. He became the perfect sacrifice. But let me tell you that part of this business of salvation is not just a matter of his death. It's not even just a matter of his resurrection. If he died and he stayed there, it meant nothing. If he, even if he died and he rose again, it meant nothing. But you see, it never stopped there. He told Mary, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father and your father because there he would become our great high priest ever living to make intercession for you and me. Let me tell you something that thrills my soul every time I think about it. I heard a Jewish teacher one time sharing this truth, and I thought it was one of the most powerful things that I'd ever heard. Here's what he said. He said when Jesus, uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, asked Jesus if he was the king of Israel or the son of God, and Jesus said, you say that I am, which meant that he affirmed that he was right. It says that Caiaphas tore his garment. Let me tell you that under Jewish law, the law of God, if the high priest tore his robe, he immediately dropped dead on the spot. They had reinforced the neck of that robe because they did not want the high priest to die on the spot if he accidentally or on purpose tore the robe. But in that culture, when someone was showing their utter distaste for something, they would tear their garments. Caiaphas didn't drop dead. 
Why did Caiaphas not drop dead? Because Caiaphas was not the legitimate high priest. Because you see, the Romans had appointed Caiaphas as the high priest. He was not God's choice. So who was the high priest? Well, let me tell you about a man. A man who uh, went, went to the desert in, in, in camel's hair, ate locusts and wild honey. His mother, uh, his father was Zacharias. His mother was Elizabeth. And the, that man, though both of those people were descended from the Levites. And that meant that John Baptist was supposed to have been the high priest rather than Caiaphas. And when J John baptized Jesus in the water, he was, uh, somebody has once asked the question, well, why in the world did did Jesus be, need to be baptized? He had no sin. Well, let me tell you why. It's because he said to fulfill all righteousness. Because when the high priest was anointed, first he was washed. That washing took place. Then the anointing of the Holy Spirit came down upon him. And from that moment on, Jesus became our legitimate high priest in the presence of Almighty God. He died as a sacrifice, but he rose as our high priest, and he ever lives to make intercession for you and me. I'm talking about Jesus today. I'm talking about the Savior of the world. I'm talking about the only one who can change your life. As our Savior, He's also our deliverer. Life controlling problems aren't a problem. That's why Teen Challenge has a greater percentage rate of uh, a less recidivism than any other drug program is because Jesus is the deliverer. Jesus is our healer. My friend, I'm not talking to you about the, today about something that I haven't experienced. I told you this story when we were here before. I'm going to just briefly allude to it. Our son, when he was seven years old, was severely burned. The doctors kept telling us he will never make it through this because of infection. He will die. He will die. He will die. For 31 days, we walked around his bed. For 31 days, he, we watched him quit breathing for five on sep five separate occasions his eyes would roll back in his head on one of the occasions the doctor the 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 respiratory therapist said he's gone and she said it just so happened that i was in there and i could bring him back i don't have an office here my office is on the first floor this is the 11th i don't come up here but i was here just outside the door why was she there because jesus told her to be there Jesus told her to be there. My wife, on two different occasions, has fought cancer. On two different occasions, the doctor said, you just very well may not make it. But will you agree with me that she's still very much alive today? Why? Because Jesus is the healer. Because Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the healer. My grandson, who is here today, had to spend two weeks in an incubator because when he came, he didn't have enough breath. But Jesus is the answer. Today he's a lot stockier than his brother and I tell him it was because he was on the bottom and he had to hold him up for nine months. Because Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the baptizer. Oh, friends, I am so thankful to be Pentecostal today. I am so glad to be Pentecostal. I would not want to be anything else. I am so glad to be a spirit-filled believer. I am so glad to be in a spirit-filled church. You don't know how fortunate you are to be in a church that emphasizes the Pentecostal experience. Thank God for that. 
But I want you to know it's because of Jesus. He said, I will send you another comforter. And he did. He sent us the Holy Spirit to not only be with us, but to be in us and to witness of Jesus to us. And let me tell you, there's nothing in the world that will make you believe any more than what we've seen. I went up to a, a village far, far from our camp in, in a place called the Loyalty Hills. And I preached in a little tin shed that we had built as a church. We, the place was full of Messiah, full of Messiah. I mean, these people had never heard. One time they heard of Jesus because we preached it. And then, but they'd never, they, they knew nothing about the Pentecostal experience. I mean, they had never seen Benny Hinn, not, not even once. Because they don't even have a television set. They don't have a radio, much less a television. And they'd never seen any of this kind of stuff. And we preached on the infilling of the Holy Spirit that morning. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. They started coming down one at a time down the aisle. And as they would get to the front, they would just pass out. One side, one side, one side, one side. And five, there must have been a pile of my side this high on both sides. And all of them were speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. What, 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 are, what do they sound like when they're filled with the Holy Spirit? Just like you do. Just like you do. You, you could hear the same kind of language as you hear around here. And those Messiah who had never heard any of this in their entire lives are the, laying on the floor speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. It's real, folks. It's real. And then I want to tell you, He's not only our Savior. He's not only our healer. He's not only our deliverer. But He is our soon coming King. You know, when Jesus came into Jerusalem on what was called the triumphal entry, he was riding on the back of a donkey. Why? Because in the customs of that day, when a king came in peace, he rode on a donkey. If he was riding in war, he, wore, he rode a white stallion. And let me tell you, the king who came into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago riding on a, white, on a donkey is soon coming riding on a white stallion to execute judgment against his enemies. And let me just tell you, folks, you don't want to be one of his enemies. You want to be one of his friends when he comes back to this earth to gather his church to himself and to execute judgment upon this world. You want to be behind him. You don't want to be in front of him because the Prince of Peace is going to become the man of war because he's going to bring judgment to his enemies on this earth. I want to tell you, he is the Son of the living God. He is, he is the Savior. He is the healer. But let me tell you what else he is. He's the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the ending. He is the first. He is the last. He is the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bright morning star. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the bread of life. He's the water of life. He's the door. He's the way. He's the truth, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. He is the creator. He is the sustainer of creation. He is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the fourth man in the fire. He is the captain of the Lord's host. He is the seed of Abraham. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the king kinsman redeemer. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the prophet without equal. He is the great high priest. He is Messiah. He is Jehovah. He is the prince of peace. And as John said, I guess all the books that have ever been written would never fill all the information as to what he is and what he does. Jesus. 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 Jesus, would you stand with me, please, and just say it? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let me tell you something, folks. Where you're sitting, where you are right now, if you need healing, he's the healer. If you need the baptism in the Holy Spirit, he's the baptizer. 
If you need a Savior, He is the Savior this morning. He is anything you need Him to be. When He comes back, His name will be changed from Jesus to King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Because He is in any generation what man needs him to be and now he is our savior our deliverer our baptizer our soon coming king whatever you need today it's yours I've told you personal experiences of how Jesus has healed how he's delivered how he's set us free time and time and time and time again. And please forgive me for using personal illustrations, but one thing people can't argue about with you about is a testimony. Thank you for that testimony earlier, brother. He knows it happened to him. People can't argue with the testimony. And whatever you need today, Jesus is here by his Spirit to give you whatever you need. While every head is bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you first and foremost, is there anyone in this building you're not saved? You may be religious. You may have had some kind of experience in the past, but you know without a doubt that you're not saved. I want you to know Jesus is here to be your Savior today and to become your intercessor before the throne of God. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I wonder if there's one person in the house that will lift your hand and say, I need Jesus as my Savior. I'm not saved today, but I want to be saved. I do not want to miss heaven. Would you lift your hand anywhere in the house? Anywhere in the house. Just lift it up so I can see it. I want to pray for you. Anywhere in the house. Anywhere in the house. I know we prayed earlier, but is there anyone in the house who needs healing for your body? I want you just to raise your hand as an affirmation that you need a touch. There's one, two, three. Many hands going up all over the building. Without hesitation, why don't you just come and sit on this altar so that we can have people to come and pray for you? Jesus is here. It isn't because Cheshire is here. It isn't because Pastor is here. It isn't because the elders are here. It's because Jesus is here. If you need healing for your body, just come and sit. But come expecting a miracle. Come expecting a miracle. Come expecting.